Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. A trailer with enough football equipment to supply around 100 low income children stolen in broad daylight. Yeah, it was all captured on camera, which you can see right here where a truck is driving off with that trailer. It belongs to the San Antonio Brahma Sports Organization, which is set to start their practices for this upcoming season next month. The president of the organization tells me this is beyond hearts breaking for the families they serve. They could just bring it up here, park it and run. I don't care. President of the San Antonio Junior Brahmas Sports Organization, Lori Black, is desperate for the return of their trailer filled with $10,000 worth of football equipment. There's a lot of love in that trailer. Conditioning, practice and game day gear all stolen back in May, but the organization didn't find out about it until recently. Black was shown this surveillance video capturing the theft at the Storage for You facility on Nacogdoches, just down the street from where the kids practice and play at Lady Bird Johnson Park. Apparently the suspects went in, took one trailer, left, came back, took another trailer, left, came back, and then took ours and left. This is the second time their trailer has been stolen from a secure location. With the organization serving mostly low-income children ages 4 to 18, Black is devastated. It just hurt. Very hurt. I mean, how do you, you see little cleats. We had cleats in there. I mean, these were children's things. The organization is now having to start from scratch, but says they are not going to let this stop them from participating in this season of football. They're not going to stop us. They're not going to stop these kids from playing. She says she hopes the people responsible for this theft realizes this not only hurts their program, but it's a direct hit to the children. Find God, ask for forgiveness. I forgive them, but they need some help. They need to figure it out. You don't steal from children. You don't. The organization has been contacted by other youth programs to offer their support. They are also raising money and are in need of donations. If you would like to help, you can find out how on our website at ksat.com. Take a look now at some of the day's top stories. It was a close call overnight as San Antonio police, uh, a crime scene investigator and medical examiner all diving for cover after they say shots were fired in their direction. It happened during a murder investigation off East South Cross. That's over on the south side. Police say they were working the scene after a man was found fatally shot in the roadway. And that's when officers said they could hear shots zipping above their heads with at least one round striking the road near them. They all took cover behind their vehicles. Additional officers then called to the area to help them get out of the line of fire, get in contact with nearby residents, and set up a perimeter. No one was able to identify where those shots came from, but they were able to eventually safely clear the scene. Investigations continuing now into both the murder and that shooting. Caught in the crossfire, a man sent to the hospital overnight after police say he was hit by a stray bullet. It was just after midnight when police say a group of men were hanging out in a parking lot off of I-35 and Gladstone. They told police two cars driving on the access road started shooting at each other. That's when one of the men was hit in the leg. He was taken to the hospital and is expected to be okay. No arrests have been made and police say the only description they have to go on is two dark colored vehicles. Overnight, a pregnant woman hospitalized and her family home destroyed following a fire. It happened close to 1230 this morning in the 3900 block of South Pine Street. Firefighters say the flames started in the back of the home in the kitchen or bedroom area. Five people were inside at the time, two adults and three kids and two dogs. The flames quickly spreading to the rest of the home and fire officials say the pregnant woman had to break out a window to escape. All five people made it out safely. One of the two dogs died. A cause for that fire remains unknown. I've never seen it like this. This is the first time I've seen this. This is a Catholic cemetery. It shouldn't be like this. Over the past few months, the defenders have been inundated with complaints about the conditions at cemeteries owned by the Archdiocese of San Antonio. Tall weeds and grass, headstones buried under mud and dirt, and some grave sites that have sunken several feet. Not at all what you expect to see when visiting your loved ones. So what's going on? Well, I spent the past several weeks visiting the cemeteries and talking to family members, some who have taken it upon themselves to clean up the mess. It's tonight's Defenders Investigation. <laughs> Juan Becerra is mowing the grass at a Catholic cemetery, San Fernando number two, but that's not his job. 
I don't work for San Fernando. Yeah. I just come and do my yard for my grandpa and my, my cousins right here. Uh huh. My baby cousins. You see, Juan has a lot of respect for the dead and wants his family's eternal resting place to be peaceful. But lately, he's been spending more time taking care of these grave sites. I don't come real often. I just come like when I see that the grass is real, real tall. When I talked to Juan in early June, we were just starting to dry out from all the rain we had in May. While we saw crews doing some mowing that day, many areas of the cemetery were overgrown. But Becerra wasn't that upset. The thing is that they cannot catch up because of the rain. I understand that. That's why I come and try to help them out. He's not alone. Over the course of six weeks of visits to the cemetery, we encountered several people doing their own lawn care at a loved one's gravesite. We just have to take it upon ourselves to clean up. Uh, her uh, mom and dad, you couldn't even see it, so we cleaned it up a little. Miguel Herrera started bringing his lawn tools after seeing the conditions on Mother's Day. But he isn't just taking care of his own family. I even started doing some of the other people, but I said, God, you know. You could be here all day, right? You could be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> you feel guilty. Yeah, there's a lot of guilt uh, involved just leaving them like that. I have my dad and my brother here. Tito Reyes has also started taking care of the graves around his family. Do you think that this is, should be the job of the cemetery? Or yes, it is. It should. Yeah. Or get a contractor or somebody, you know, come and do this. Other people we talked to had trouble even finding their loved one's graves. If they're not hidden by tall grass and weeds, they're covered in dirt and debris. The last time I was out here with my wife was about a year ago, and she got real upset. I mean, because she was like, this was like, one of this was like her parents here, and it was all covered with mud. Yeah. Like you couldn't even see it. On this visit, Paul Shope needed help finding the stones that were hidden by weeds. In several areas of San Fernando number two, we found evidence of flooding. And worse, deep tire tracks from heavy machinery that went right over gravestones. It just makes me really sad, you know, because all these people are paying money to have these gravestones put in here. I know because I just got through paying. Yeah. They deserve better than this. Some areas of the cemeteries are so overgrown, it looks like it has been abandoned for years, but other problems we found seem to go well beyond them not keeping up with basic maintenance. Over at San Fernando number three, we found fallen tree limbs resting on headstones, water taps that don't work, and sinkholes opening up near headstones. But that's not all. We also found several grave sites throughout the cemeteries, just like this one, where the ground has sunk in several feet. Some families taking their own steps to fix it. That was terrible. One. That one over there. Miguel Alvarado Martinez was watering the new grass he planted on his wife's grave. She had only been buried a few weeks, but he didn't want to see hers sink like the others in her section. They should come and fix them. To be fair, we did notice on other visits that some of the sunken graves had been filled in. And over at number two, Daniel Zaragoza says he complained about a sinking grave right next to his mom's. Because, I mean, there was a deep hole, like at least three feet down. Yeah. I mean, some an accident could happen or something, but I mean, yeah, they pulled it up, actually. The archdiocese didn't answer several direct questions about the conditions at both cemeteries, but did pledge to do better. I hope so. I don't know really what the answer is, because I don't really know if uh, what they're telling us is is correct or the truth you know they're just saying whatever now in a statement the archdiocese of san antonio said cemetery personnel have been working diligently in conducting burials as well as care of the cemetery sites which have been impacted by recent heavy sustained rains issues are being addressed in a planned manner as weather conditions continue improving to read more of their statement look for this story on ksat.com missing in those statements any sort of apology to all those families who are so upset We'll be checking it again to see if conditions improve out there. It actually felt really great as like we're Mexican, so it's really good that we were able to celebrate this year. Well, if you didn't get your share of chicken on a stick, live music, or the latest Fiesta medal, you still have a couple of hours to get your Fiesta on before the party wraps up. The Night Team's Jonathan Cotto is live tonight at Market Square and tells us how people are saying goodbye to the final night of Fiesta. Jonathan? 
That's right, Tim. And Jaffney Market Square has certainly been filled with crowds of people enjoying the sights and sounds of Fiesta all day, and the party is still going. And now, it's definitely been a treat for so many people considering that it was canceled last year. Now, it's been 11 days of Fiesta San Antonio, and the crowds were here for it. Fiesta San Antonio kicked off on the 17th with Fiesta Fiesta at Hemisphere Park. And although this year's events were held on a different month and with fewer events, the turnout was nothing short of a success. It just feels so good to be back. I've missed Fiesta so much. It was like hands down one of my favorite parts of being from San Antonio. I'm so proud to be from here. Well, if you missed it, you missed a good time. Don't forget us next year. I want to cry. I, I look around and I, I just can't believe it. It's it's awesome. It's different. It's different. I like it. KSAT, we love you. I don't have IFB. That was Jonathan Coteau reporting live for us. Obviously, some technical difficulties out there. Katie. Too much party. Yeah, I think Down so. There on the last night, we tried to fit it in here these last couple of hours. Uh, taking a look outside, it was honestly a good day if you could dodge some of those afternoon downpours. It wasn't so hot today and this evening. We're already seeing our temperatures in the 70s, so... Not a bad evening to wrap up Fiesta for this year. 74 our morning low up to 88 at the airport this afternoon because of those downpours that were bouncing around out there for a portion of the day. We've got more downpours in the forecast, not only Monday, but also for the next couple of days. That means it's still not going to be as hot as we start this new work week. We'll talk more about that and get you a sneak peek of the 4th of July forecast coming up in just a bit. Tim. Thank you, Katie. Meanwhile, rain and storms are hampering ongoing rescue efforts following that condo collapse near Miami and the death toll continuing to rise. The latest from the scene tonight when the night beat continues. To the latest now on the search for survivors in Surfside, Florida, the death toll from the building collapse now at nine and still more than 150 people unaccounted for. But their families are holding out hope. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest from Surfside. So many distraught families seeing the destruction at Champlain Tower South up close for the first time. Buses taking them to the site. This was something that many of the family members had requested and they were very grateful for the opportunity. The delicate search mission still going strong. Not only do we have the risk of collapse, the risk of getting injured with the debris, all, all of that that's there, but we've had to deal, like you said, with rain, a compound with that, the smoke, it's been very challenging. Leo Soto hoping for some good news about his friends. They were on the eighth floor. There's always hope that the Miami rescue team can pull a miracle and get some survivors out of there. And now the town of Surfside releasing documents on the building from 2018. The estimated cost was $9.1 million to address issues raised in a 2018 report that found major structural damage to the concrete below the pool deck, including failed waterproofing. Engineer is also filing another document at the time describing the overall concrete framing as being in good condition. Susanna Alvarez telling NPR she lived on the 10th floor and says back in 2018 after the inspection, a Surfside inspector assured residents the building was in very good shape. No one ever, ever, ever told us that this that that building was in such bad shape. ABC News has confirmed that official assured the building was fine and a current Surfside commissioner tells us that inspectors interpretation of the 2018 report was misleading. Residents at the identical sister building under a voluntary evacuation. Rena Roy, ABC News, Surfside, Florida. Back here at home, as promised, we got some of those downpours today, Katie, really affecting our temperature, cooling us off a bit. Mm. Oh, really nice. Yeah, even if you didn't get the rain, there was still a good amount of cloud cover around from those sh showers and storms. And so that kind of helped to uh, keep our temperatures down a little bit this afternoon. But if you want some rain for your yard and you didn't get it today, you will have a chance over the next couple of days. And then look at our almanac. I just want to show you how 
Much rain really didn't fall at the airport. We only picked up one one hundredth of an inch, but there were some higher totals out there, even as close as shirts. 1.45 inches measured today in shirts. Meanwhile, just south of Canyon Lake, a quarter of an inch, a little bit more than a quarter inch of a rain of rain in Kerrville there uh, and some higher totals, a little bit more than half an inch in Sutherland Springs, uh, about three uh, three tenths of an inch there in Gonzales. So hit or miss rain. That'll continue for the next couple of days as well. So some scattered downpours as we get into Monday and Tuesday. As you saw with the rainfall totals from today, if you get under one of those downpours, you could pick up a quick one to as much as two inches of rain, depending on how heavy the rain is and how long it hangs around your yard. And I want to reiterate, just like what we saw today, no severe weather expected over the coming days. You may hear some rumbles of thunder, see some flashes of lightning and rain could be heavy, but we're not going to see organized thunderstorms and that will really cut down any concern for hail or damaging winds. So just keep that in mind over the next couple of days at the airport right now. Pretty comfortable. I mean, it's humid. Our dew point is high, but our air temperature is down into the upper 70s. So it feels like 79 out there. Winds are light out of the north northeast, just about five miles per hour. 79 in Hondo, 87 in Del Rio and 82 down in Catula. So a little bit warmer off to the west of I-35. As far as the rainfall goes, things are really quiet. Any of those thunder showers really fell apart after sunset. Uh, these showers and non severe storms are very dependent on the heat of the day. So as the sun comes up in the morning, they start to kind of bubble up. They hang with us through the afternoon. And then as we get past sunset, they fizzle out not only here, but also off closer to the Houston area down in deep south Texas as well. That trend will also continue over the next couple of days. So heading into the overnight hour, skies will become mostly cloudy. And by early tomorrow morning, I can't rule out a few little showers here or there, but coverage wise, we're just going to give it about a 20% chance for an early morning shower tomorrow. Temperature wise, starting off mid to upper 70s, low 70s in the hill country winds light out of the east, just about five to 10 miles per hour. So again, very similar to today as we get to lunchtime and then the afternoon hours, we'll start to see more of those downpours pop up across the area. Again, no concern for severe weather, but certainly through the afternoon, maybe a few flashes of lightning and some rumbles of thunder. Again, that rain is going to be pretty hit or miss, but coverage wise, we'll be at about a 40% chance tomorrow, mainly through the afternoon hours. High temperatures, upper 80s for a lot of us. Those that don't see rain, you could sneak into the low 90s uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, as far as we uh, what we have going on across Texas here, kind of very similar weather, uh, especially as through the southern portion of the state over to portions of Louisiana. Uh, and the reason why we saw those downpours pop up this afternoon while they'll be around tomorrow uh, is this little area, this little closed low level circulation uh, that's in the far western Gulf of Mexico about to move on shore in deep south Texas. This is just a nice little piece of some rain making energy as indicated by this red and yellow color. This is going to continue to slowly drift across deep south Texas tomorrow. Some lingering energy into to Tuesday, and that's why we'll keep a chance for those mainly afternoon downpours around the next couple of days. We'll lose some of that energy by the middle of the week, and that's when we'll start to trim back our chances of rain. So that's what's going on here. Uh, this is an unusual weather pattern for us here this time of year, so we will certainly take it. I was very happy to forecast 86 for tomorrow afternoon for us here as we approach the end of June. Again, your best chance of rain Monday and into Tuesday will primarily be after lunchtime through late afternoon. Now look ahead to the 4th of July forecast. It's our next big forecast coming up here. It looks like it's not going to be too terribly hot because rain chances will hang around guys. Hopefully that doesn't stop the fireworks for hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> thanks Katie. Yeah. The extreme heat wave continues in the Pacific Northwest. Coming up at 1030, how those living without air conditioning are trying to keep cool. Followed up by What's Up South Texas a little later in our newscast. A preview of Instant Replay next. San Antonio Spurs assistant coach Becky Hammond misses out on a shot to become the first woman head coach in NBA history. With more of that and what's on Instant Replay tonight, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. Yeah, she had a chance in Portland. We'll see what happens with some other interviews coming up here. And San Antonio's own world champion Mario Barrios suffers his first defeat of his professional boxing career. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. 
I hope that we'll have an organization that will look beyond the fact that, oh, Becky's a female, and really give her her due diligence as far as what she's able to accomplish. Becky Hammond has been a finalist for the vacant head coaching job of the Portland Trailblazers. That job has now gone to former Detroit Piston Chauncey Billups. Is that the end of Hammond's shot at becoming the first female head coach in NBA history this offseason, or is there still a chance? Paul throws it up for eight, and throws it down. Now, the Phoenix Suns are now 1-1 away from their first trip to the NBA Finals in 28 years. Can they put away L.A. in Game 5, or is there another comeback left in the Clippers without Kawhi Leonard? San Antonio world champion Mario Barrio suffers the first defeat in the professional boxing career after an 11th round TKO to Gervonta Davis. What was the turning point of the main event? We will show you all that. Plus, now that John C. Billups has been named the new head coach in Portland, will Spurs assistant coach Becky Hammond become the first female head coach in the NBA this offseason? Tonight, you decide. Instant replay is live, and it's after the night beat. Still, by my count, four jobs left open. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg. We'll see you again in just a bit. We'll see you on the other side of this break. A dangerous heat wave is impacting the Pacific Northwest, much of the reason seeing record-breaking temperatures, which are expected to continue throughout at least Tuesday. Yeah, much of the West experiencing extreme heat and the hot and dry conditions are only intensifying drought conditions and raising concerns over potential fires. Here's ABC's Ike Jachi with the details. The Pacific Northwest is dealing with an historic heat wave. Washington and Oregon seeing temperatures up to 30 degrees above normal. Unfortunately, we're starting to see this year after year. It's getting hotter and hotter. Air conditioning units in high demand. We know that uh, a lot of the people in this area don't have air conditioning because it's only needed a handful of days out of the year. People lined up outside this hardware store but left empty handed. I apologize. We're supposed to get more in. According to the Census Bureau, in 2019, only 44% of homes in Seattle had air conditioning. In Portland, that figure was 79%. Residents doing what they can to stay cool. The windows are open overnight to let the cool air in, and then we close them mid-morning and draw the drapes. But it's not just the Pacific Northwest. Seven western states are included in this heat wave. 33 million people under heat alerts. Heat starting earlier than it, it did. Usually it's like the 4th of July is when it really hits up here, so it's earlier this time around. Fire officials preparing. We're now right back into it and having to be prepared moment by moment, day by day, for uh, an eventual brush fire that's going to happen that's going to call us all out to the field again. And public health officials are expressing concern about what impact climate change could have on public health. Many of my colleagues who are uh, experts in environmental health say, you know, we thought we had another decade before we would find ourselves in situations like this, and yet here we are. In Washington, Ike Jachi, ABC News. Sticking with weather, roads are closed across Detroit and surrounding areas as the city struggles from flooding from storms which soaked the area over the weekend. The water submerged hundreds of vehicles and entered many homes. Several roads are still closed, bringing traffic to a standstill in many locations. City officials are working to activate pumping stations to remove the water. They are also asking trapped residents to contact them for help. Meanwhile, one area north of Detroit picked up after what might have been a tornado. There was no warning, and it was just like a, a freight train jet engine sound. And then it just dropped, and it was, you know, here and gone within about five seconds. Detroit's mayor declared a state of emergency Saturday. Michigan's mayor also declared one for that area. Well, after seeing that big time heat in the West and that severe weather and flooding, uh, we have nothing to complain about as far as our weather goes here in South Central Texas. It's humid out there this evening, but it's not as warm as it typically is. We didn't warm up as much this afternoon because of those uh, scattered downpours that were around. I want to show you high temperatures across the country briefly. Pretty cool through the central portion of the country, but there's Portland and Seattle. Both those numbers, 112 the high in Portland, 104 in Seattle. Those are both new all time record highs for both of those cities. So that heat is no joke. And guess what? It gets hotter in the Pacific Northwest tomorrow. More extreme heat for that region on Monday before temperatures finally start to back off through the middle part of this week. More on our local forecast, including a look ahead to the next seven days of rainfall coming up in a bit. Tim.
Thank you, Katie. In the wake of the Florida condo collapse, the city of Miami is calling for inspections of all buildings that are over six stories tall and 40 years old. A letter sent Friday urges building owners to have a qualified engineer provide status reports on every structure in that category. If visible signs of structural damage or distress are identified, the city of Miami wants to have the report within 45 days. In the meantime, the city is reviewing the guidelines for building inspections to make sure they catch any structural issues earlier. For those wishing to help victims of the condo collapse, the Better Business Bureau is warning against fraudulent fundraising. The organization is advising people who wish to donate to seek established charities that meet its standards for charity accountability. For those who would rather support a crowdfunding campaign, the Bureau says you can tell a lot by the posting. It advises reading the words carefully and making sure the funds will be used for specific purposes. The organization also says photos are often used without permission. So don't assume money will benefit whoever is pictured in the listing. After a largely virtual celebration last year, the New York City Pride March was back today. One notable absence, though, the New York Police Department, whose gay officers and allies had been marching since 1996 in that event. Two months ago, organizers announced a five-year ban on the NYPD's participation in the march. There is tension between the LGBTQ plus community and police over violence last year during an unsanctioned queer liberation march. Witnesses say police used excessive force and pepper spray on gay activists then. NYC Pride officials say banning the police is a return to the activist spirit of the Stonewall Uprising, which kicked off the gay rights movement in America. Coming up, two local women are giving a new meaning to the term cat lady. They're next on What's Up South Texas. Spay and neuter your pets. That is the message two ladies are sending after they have spent a few years catching cats to spay and neuter before releasing them back in their neighborhood. That's right. They're next on What's Up South Texas. They share with me their love for what they do and why. For over 70 years, Jane Mashburn has been fascinated with cats. I've had them since I was old enough to know what they were. While living at the Army Residence Community, an assisted living facility, she noticed several cats walking around the property. That means more cats, more kittens. So she decided to do something about it. She and her friend Mary Gustine established a cat program where they trap, spay, and neuter cats before releasing them. Okay, this is a, a, a humane trap. It is a approved by the Feral Cat Coalition. We've all gone through the program of learning how to be trappers. When they hit that part right there, this door comes now and they're trapped. They can't get out. It can be challenging. There are times that when you trap a big tomcat to be taken in to be neutered, it's very difficult for us to lift. But they do whatever it takes to care for cats and kittens while preventing overpopulation in the area. It's all kinds of bad things that can happen to them. Several volunteers help maintain cat feeding stations they've created, and several residents help out with fostering and adopting strays. So far, they've been able to trap, spay, and neuter over 20 cats and have fostered and adopted out over 40 kittens. I'd love to see every cat get a good home. Yes. They all deserve a good home. They even tend to the injured cats like Daisy here. Daisy came to me when no bat was open. She had her left eye hanging out of her socket. Their program is costly, but it is fully funded by donations. They encourage everyone to spay and neuter their pets. We all live on this earth. We all have a right to be here. For What's Up South Texas, I'm Jaffney Gray. Intermittent fasting is a hot health trend right now, but there are ways to do it right and wrong. We'll take a look at some of the do's and don'ts next on the night. Feed. Intermittent fasting, it has become another hot fitness trend. People do it for various reasons, from losing weight to just improving their overall health. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz looks at how to benefit from the concept while avoiding some downsides. 
Gisela Long started intermittent fasting two years ago after struggling to reach her fitness goals. I do the 16 8 intermittent fasting, so I start my day um, eating at 12 p.m. Just uh, right after my workout, I end up like around 8 or 9 p.m. at night. I have lost 20 pounds during that progress. Intermittent fasting is an eating plan that focuses more on when you eat rather than what you eat. Typically, people eat only during an eight hour period or only every other day. Studies suggest it may have benefits, including improved blood sugar, cholesterol, and blood pressure. When done in a healthful way, intermittent fasting can help control inflammation and may even lower the risk of heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and some cancers. But intermittent fasting is not safe for everyone. It could be too extreme for older adults or people with diabetes or other health issues. Whether you fast or not, Consumer Reports says you can still incorporate some of the strategies to help your metabolism. Be sure to include foods that have plenty of fiber and protein, such as fruit, oatmeal, cottage cheese, and eggs. Foods like these will help you stay satisfied until your next meal. Also, if you like sweets, CR suggests having them before 3 p.m. when your body is more efficient at processing carbs. And eat dinner between 6 and 8, a dinner that includes plenty of veggies. I feel that I have more energy. I feel I feel like I'm 25 <laughs> instead of my real age. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Taking a look at weather right now. First and foremost, Katie, I want to say happy early birthday to my mom. Aww. She's from Arkansas. Her birthday will be tomorrow, but she's coming to visit. And I just want to know, is the heat going to be, you know, OK for her or is it going to be too unbearable? This, <laughs> this week? She's actually picking a pretty good week to come visit because it's not going to be as hot as it could be this time of year. Wait, so we can party. Yes, absolutely. You <laughs> may have to dodge a few downpours, especially through the first part of the week. We'll drop our rain chances Thursday into Friday, but then it looks like they roll back in for the 4th of July weekend. More on that shortly. I do want to update you on what's going on in the tropics. As of tonight, two areas at the National Hurricane Center is watching for some potential development over the next two to five days. We'll start with that uh, easternmost system still out in the mid-Atlantic. It's got a 20 to 30 percent chance of becoming at least a tropical depression in the next two to five days. This could try to wander uh, into parts of the Caribbean over the next uh, five days or so. We'll keep an eye on that. A little bit closer to the east coast, though, uh, that orange X there is an area of some shower and thunderstorm activity in the Atlantic that's starting to drift toward uh, South Carolina, Georgia, uh, the northern Florida uh, coast there, northern Florida east coast, and it's got a 50% chance of becoming at least a tropical depression in the next two days. We'll keep an eye on that. It won't have any impact on our weather, but if that becomes at least a tropical storm, next name on the list here is Danny. Shortly thereafter, Elsa, Fred, and then Grace for this year's uh, Hurricane names there for our 2021 hurricane season. Meanwhile, here at home, it was toasty in spots. Don't get me wrong. 101 the high in Laredo, 97 in Carrizo Springs, also 97 in Del Rio. But areas west of 35 had a harder time cashing in on some of those downpours that were around this afternoon. So that's why it was a little bit hotter off to the west. Looking ahead to this week, we're going to keep our high temperatures slightly below normal for this time of year, mid to upper 80s through the middle of the week because of some higher rain chances. So kind of like today. We'll see some increased clouds around that along with those downpours will help to limit our temperatures to the mid to upper 80s. Toward the back half of the week, we'll raise temperatures as rain chances drop off a bit for a few days out there at the airport 77 starting to pull in some low clouds skies will become mostly cloudy overnight through early tomorrow morning temperature wise we're going to see our lows drop into the low to mid 70s in most spots 77 right now at the airport 78 and Gonzales and still some spots in the low 80s humidity is up there for sure I had someone on Facebook today um, I posted an afternoon radar update what we were expecting for the rest of the day and uh, they were like Humidity is so bad. And I was like, well, yeah, but it would still be bad even if we didn't have the rain around. So at least there are some downpours out there if we have to deal with the humidity. So it is humid. Winds are fairly light for the time being, about 5 to 10 miles per hour. Uh, that's where they'll stay through the overnight hours. Winds about 5 to 15 out of the east-southeast for your Monday. So tomorrow will look a lot like today, Tuesday as well. 
a low chance of an early shower as we get closer to late morning, midday and then into the afternoon. That'll be our best chance of rain. Some more of those downpours popping up with some heavy rain, maybe some flashes of lightning, but again, no severe weather expected tomorrow or over the next several days. So out there, things are pretty quiet. We are starting to see an increase in cloud cover. And as I mentioned, clouds will build in overnight and a stray shower, isolated shower. Not out of the question through early tomorrow, but again, as we get closer to lunchtime, things are starting to heat up. We'll see those downpours become a bit more numerous hit or miss with that uh, heavy rain tomorrow afternoon. If you do find yourself under one of those downpours, you could pick up a really quick one to two inches of rain. Those are the types of totals we saw today. Uh, taking a slightly longer look beyond the planning forecast through uh, 4th of July here and even into uh, uh, seven to 10 days from now, we've got a 50% chance to see above average Average precipitation and here's what our rainfall potential looks like over the next seven days. This is pretty good for this time of year. Uh, a lot of spots, especially along and west of 35, maybe one to two inches of rain, but maybe some higher totals higher than two, uh, maybe two to three inches for some areas, especially east of the I 35 corridor over the next seven days. So that does mean that as of right now, we've got a chance of rain for 4th of July weekend, 30% chance for some isolated showers into next weekend. We'll be keeping a very close eye on that forecast for you. I wouldn't be surprised if we have to up rain chances just a little bit, but at least that means it won't be crazy hot out there. So that's some good news, guys. Yeah, if we want to make this one of those years we don't hit 100, that would be perfectly fine. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. Well, uh, there was never any doubt what would be the weekend's number one movie, only how much money it would make. The results in your weekend box office report next. You, Grabego. Cruella spent a third straight weekend in fifth place, earning $3.7 million. It's up to $71 million domestic. Peter Rabbit 2, The Runaway, took fourth place with 4.85 million. The hitman's wife's bodyguard fell from first to third on ticket sales of $4.9 million. A Quiet Place Part 2 stayed strong in second. $6.2 million put the sequel at $136 million domestic. F9 The Fast Saga zoomed off the starting line, beginning its North American run with $70 million, the biggest opening weekend since Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker 18 months ago. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. Just when you think you've seen everything a car can do, they have F9. All right, who would you place on the Mount Rushmore of San Antonio star athletes? Tonight, two more names submitted to our Tower of Power. And the Texas Longhorns run at the College World Series is over. With more on what's on instant replay tonight, let's head over to our very own Greg Simmons. Yeah, it's just a shame how it ended because they had yeah. overcome so much adversity to get to where they were and just have it all happen at the end of the ninth inning. And San Antonio FC is returning home with a road draw against the Real Monarchs SLC coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. The San Antonio Spurs are your world champion. We continue our summer Tower of Power regarding the elite of San Antonio athletes. Two more nominations tonight. One in basketball, the other who made a big name for himself in the NFL. And San Antonio FC is bringing home a road draw. They're facing the Real Monarchs SLC last night in Salt Lake City. What a moment. The Texas Longhorns run to the College World Series is over after six rain delays, four elimination games, and it took a bottom of the nine to walk off RBI to end their season. We'll show you how it went down and who takes game three of the Eastern Conference Finals between the Hawks and the Bucks. We've got all the highlights tonight. All that plus what happens now that the U.S. Supreme Court has sacked the NCAA over what Division I athletes are entitled to. The sports guys are back tonight with their opinions. Instant replay is live, and it's next, and it's probably going to change the scope of how athletes are exactly paid going forward. Yeah, game changer. Big time. Thank you, Greg. We'll see you in just a bit. Smartphones and other electronics keep getting more and more expensive. Tomorrow, GMSA will tell you how much you can save by purchasing refurbished electronics instead and how you can score a good deal.